Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and today I'd like to talk to you about my favorite cap and ball revolver, the Colt 1860 Army Revolver. Now, I know a lot of you Remington fans are already getting on the keyboard to type a comment to tell me that Remingtons were a better gun because they had a solid top strap, better sights, and you could do that cool cylinder switch just like Clint Eastwood and Pale Rider. And, and I'm not going to disagree with you. Um, Remington might have been a better design. Um, and you can certainly prefer Remingtons. I, I have no qualm about that at all. You're entitled to your opinion. But for me, I like Colts. And I can like Colts without disliking Remington. I mean, just because I prefer Marianne doesn't mean I think Ginger was a hag. And then for those of you who are too young to understand that reference, Google Gilligan's Island. So Colts are my favorite Captain Ball 6 gun. I mean, they've got those long, sleek looks. They just fit so well in your hand, and they balance beautifully, and they stay in the fight for a long time, and they are just a wonderful gun, and I prefer them. And today, what I would like to do is talk to you about the evolution of the 1860 Army. Because, like many great inventions, the 1860 Army revolver did not jump into Sam Colt's head like a flash of lightning, and he couldn't wait to draw that design you know, out on paper. Uh, it didn't happen that way at all. It was basically a 10-year search for the Holy Grail. And... Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that search, and we'll have to go back to the beginning, uh, which is Colt's original foray into the gun business. As I'm sure many of you know, Colt's original gun business uh, was the Patterson, New Jersey plant, and the so-called Patterson Colts. And that ended in bankruptcy for young Mr. Colt. Uh, it was not a great experience for him. And in a way that's really not his fault and it's not the fault of the weapon. I mean the gun was a little bit quirky and delicate no doubt about that but uh, he was unable to interest the army in a contract and you know there are a couple of reasons for that one of course is that the army was incredibly conservative and they thought anything besides a single shot pistol was going to be too complicated for the troops to operate, and they would just waste ammunition. Uh, and where have we heard that before, <laughs> right? I mean, I've only been hearing that for for like the entire history of the United States whenever a, a new military gun was proposed. So, uh, so that was a problem. But also, of course, the military was in a profound period of peace at that time, so they really didn't see the need for new armaments. So that left Colt with the civilian market. And the civilian market was just not that robust for a new expensive firearm uh, that they didn't really see the value in at the time. Uh, because you got to remember, uh, Colt revolvers became a paradigm shift, and people were not looking at that. Now, Colt went bankrupt, but that Patterson company laid or planted the seeds uh, for Colt's future greatness. And that's because among the customers who did buy the Colt revolving pistol uh, was the uh, Republic of Texas. And they bought 150 or so for the Texas Navy. As in everything else military, Texas was chronically short of funds. And after a while, they disbanded the Navy, and they put those Patterson Colts into storage. But they had a chronic problem on the frontier, where the Comanche and the Kiowa and the Apache were constantly raiding uh, the Texas settlements. So Texas, Texas was a more of a battleground state for European settlers versus Native Americans than Kentucky was. Uh, just tremendous amount of bloodshed. So Texas, the government of Texas, once again, formed uh, 
uh, a new ranger company under the command of Jack Coffee Hayes. And they remembered that they had those revolvers in storage. And they asked Hayes if he would like them because, of course, they were always chronically short on arms. Texas Rangers generally had to arm themselves because the state of Texas wouldn't pay for arms. So here was opportunity to get his men armed, uh, and Jack Hayes took it. And he outfitted each of his men with two of those Patterson 36 caliber five-shot revolvers. And in 1844, they proceeded to whip some Comanche butt with those pistols. And they decided that revolving pistols were the way to fight on horseback. And they became the greatest proponents of Colt's, uh, Colt's revolvers. So fast forward to the Mexican War. The Texas Rangers get federalized as, uh, as cavalry, basically, in, in the U.S. Army. And they are spreading the gospel of the revolver. And, of course, they had very few revolvers. You know, they tend to wear out arms during a war. So they were noisily requesting revolvers. And they were so impressive as a fighting force that the army listened to their demands. Uh, how's that for rare? And they dispatched one of the ranger captains, Samuel Walker, who had cut his fighting teeth under Jack Coffee Hayes. Uh, they dispatched him to find Sam Colt and to place an order for improved Colt's revolving pistols, which duly happened. So that led to the development of what we call today the Walker Colt, 1847 Walker Colt, which was used during the Mexican War. And that was the first Colt 44. Now, the Texas Rangers wanted a bigger, more powerful gun than the Patterson. They thought Patterson was underpowered at 36 caliber, five shot, with funky design things like a folding trigger and no trigger guard and uh, needlessly complex lock work. So they wanted all that stuff fixed up. They wanted a big, powerful fighting gun. And boy, did they get one. That walker was huge. It had a nine inch barrel. It was over 15 inches long uh, overall. And it weighed four and a half pounds. Uh, you just couldn't wear it on a belt. You know, you'd, you'd be brought to your knees from the weight of two of those things on your belt. Uh, so they carried them in pommel holsters uh, on their saddles. Uh, and the guns were tremendous during the Mexican War. But they had their problems. They were overpowered for the wrought iron that they were made out of, so a number of them burst. Uh, though that was probably also caused by loading them incorrectly. Because, because the walker was made to be as powerful as a common uh, percussion rifle of the time. I mean, the, the rangers saw the walker as being a handgun that replaced rifles and carbines. Uh, for fighting on horseback. So they wanted something that could reach out there, just like a rifle could. So the Walker fired a 44 caliber bullet powered by 60 grains of black powder, uh, as powerful as a rifle. But they were issued conical bullets, and those bullets did not have a rebated heel, as, as later conicals did for revolvers that made them easy to start loading uh, because the heel would fit right in the chamber and then you could you know, swag the, the rest of the bullet down in for the rammer force. Uh, these had a flat base and they were very hard to start in, in the non-chamfered uh, chambers. So what a lot of the guys started doing was loading them backwards so that the round end was loaded first so it would give them a gradual start to kind of swatch that bullet down and make it fit in the chamber. Well, unfortunately, when that flat base of the bullet slammed into the forcing cone with all the power of that 60 grain powder charge behind it, it didn't always move as well as it should have. 
and you had problems. You had problems with split barrels, you had problems with burst cylinders. So a number of Walkers did not survive uh, the war, but they still made a heck of an impression. So after the war, Colt improved the Walker, basically, by making the Dragoon line, which was still a big, heavy 44 caliber line of revolvers. But uh, it was made to be smaller and more portable and stronger than the Walker. So it had a maximum powder charge of 40 grains, had a smaller cylinder, only had a 7-inch barrel, but it still weighed 4.1 pounds. So it was a little bit of an improvement over 4.5 pounds, but still uh, a very heavy gun. And that was typically known as the Army model, the, which we call the Dragoons today. Well, in 1850, Colt released what would be its two most popular cap and ball models. Uh, it released the 1849 Pocket model, which became the best-selling uh, cap and ball pistol that Colt made. And it released the 1851 Navy model in 36 caliber. And that became the second best-selling pistol that Colt made, cap and ball revolver. So, that Navy revolver was a huge success over people who are with people who are openly carrying their six guns because it was felt to be just the right size to wear in a belt holster uh, it was not too big was not too small a caliber 36 was considered marginally uh, marginally good as as a fighting caliber not as good as a 44 but better than a 31 so that pistol was an immediate hit with people who had to carry guns and when I say pistol by the way, revolvers are pistols. All handguns are pistols. Uh, we get so wrapped around the axle today thinking that a pistol is only a semi-automatic uh, or a single shot. Uh, not the case. Uh, all handguns were considered to be pistols. Uh, so sometimes we, we, get, we get a little too crazy for our own good. But at any rate, the Navy was universally loved but it was considered a bit underpowered and what everybody wanted particularly the army wanted a gun the size of the navy and the weight of the navy you know only weighing two and a half pounds instead of four and a half pounds but that had the power of the 44 caliber dragoons so that was considered to be the holy grail of six shooters. A belt pistol, a true belt pistol, that was in 44 caliber. And Colt started working on that as soon as he saw what a success the Navy was. But it really took 10 years before it came to fruition. Now, the typical way that Colt worked to try to achieve a 44 caliber belt pistol was to start with a Dragoon and put it on a diet uh, to try to get it down to Navy weight. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But I want to talk about one other thing because Colt had another line of pistols that came out in 1855 and these were called the Root Revolvers. And they are immediately recognizable because they had a hammer that was mounted on the side of the frame even though it struck in the center of the cylinder uh, and the reason for that was so that you could remove the base pin straight out the back those guns were only available in pocket size 28 caliber and 31 caliber but they had a feature that we're going to see later on the 1860 army model now Colt did make some prototype 44 caliber root model revolvers. Uh, they never went into production. I never really saw the light of day. <clears throat> but one feature from these prototypes did make its way into the ultimate 1860 Army. 
And that was the loading lever, that rack and pinion or creeping loading lever, as, as Colt called it. Well, that came right off of the root revolvers. So that became a significant, uh, a significant part of the 1860 Army story. But ultimately, Colt decided that uh, the root revolver was not going to form the basis for a viable 44 caliber belt pistol. So they went back to working on the Dragoon model to try to get that down basically to Navy size. Started working on was taking Dragoons and milling away all of the steel that they didn't consider necessary for containing the charge. So they opened up the loading window in the barrel on both sides. They milled away the barrel lug in some cases. Uh, they milled away part of the frame itself, uh, making it more narrow uh, above where all the lock work was, you know, above where the bolt and the trigger and all that stuff was. Forward of that, they milled those down. They fluted cylinders. They had lots of experimental models that never saw production, uh, trying to achieve a belt weight 44 caliber gun based on the Dragoon. And it just wasn't working out. So somewhere around 1859, one of Colt's engineers came up with the idea that ended up being a stroke of genius. What they did is they put aside the Dragoon and they took the Navy up. Now, Colt had already been working from the other end of the Navy uh, trying to see how big a bore he could get in the cylinders. And they have experimental models that are, are bored to 40 caliber. And that was as big as they could get them. So they thought that was a dead end. Because when you got bigger than that, you started to get unsafe. But steels were getting better. And, uh, you know, Colt made, made advertising hay over what they called their silver steel. That was stronger, better, faster, smarter, smelled better. Uh, when, in fact, there might not have been any silver at all in their steel. Uh, if, if there was, they probably just sprinkled enough on to say that it was silver steel. But what they started doing, though, is they started buying very high-quality steel that was being made in England. Uh, and it was crucible steel. And it was much better than the wrought iron they'd been using for frames and cylinders and barrels up until then. Uh, it, it had very few defects in it, very few weak spots. It was very uniform. Uh, it could be cast. It was a much better metal for making guns. And it could be heat treated and hardened in different ways. When they started using that, they were able to work with thinner cylinders. But they still had a problem with the Navy. They could really only go up to about 40 and they were done. And that's when some genius at Colt got the idea of taking the Navy cylinder and increasing the diameter of the forward two-thirds of the cylinder and leaving the rear of the cylinder the same size that it had always been. and then boring that for 44 caliber. Then they could take the Navy frame and they just had to cut a little step in it to accommodate that wider part of the cylinder. But where the bolt and the trigger and all the lock work goes, that all operated on the rear end of the cylinder that was the same size as the Navy cylinder, so they didn't have to make any changes to the gun. Perfect. They also lengthened the cylinder by a little bit which meant that they cut a little bit of the forcing cone off of the barrel. Of course, having done that, they needed a 44 caliber barrel. And rather than using the Dragoon style or the Navy style, what they came up with was a very sleek, streamlined, round barrel that used that rack and pinion 
loading lever. And it's beautiful. Now these early guns still had the Navy grips on them. And that's what Colt intended to use, same grips as on the 1851 Navy. So they submitted some of these to the Ordnance Board for testing. And the Ordnance Board liked them, liked them quite a bit. But uh, they asked Colt to increase the size of the grip frame to make it as long as the grips on the Dragoon series. So Colt designed a new grip frame. He didn't just slap Dragoon grips on because they were not the right size. They, they would not have matched up with the screw holes. He would have had to have completely redesigned them anyway. So he came up with a new series of grips that were longer. And they are the classic 1860 Army grips that we're used to today. So at that point, everything was in place visually that we have today on 1860 armies. And that was just at 1860. I think it was probably November of 1860 uh, that they actually went into official production uh, with the first hundred of those, which are, are and we'll, we'll get into variations later, but they're called the short grip model because they had the Navy grip uh, and they sold like a hundred of those that they had and then they they went into the army grip production at that point but there's still one more piece of the puzzle left and, and this was actually pretty pretty important when the army made their first purchases of these guns and then they put them through extensive tests they found that a lot of them were blowing up when they were proof testing them and the way the Army proof tested them was to load them with 37 grains of powder and a heavy conical bullet. And I'm assuming that they loaded them from the muzzle uh, because you can't get that much in the chambers of the revolver and still have it rotate. Uh, but, but that would not be an uncommon way of proof testing, by the way. Even later on, uh, lever action rifles were quite often proof tested by putting an empty shell in and loading powder and, and bullets from the muzzle to put in a more of a maximum charge and see what they did. So when they fired these proof charges, what they found is that they were bulging the cylinders right over the bolt cut in the cylinder. So there's that slot that the bolt rises up into to lock the cylinder, right? Well, that's the weak point because the chambers were bored parallel uh, 0.450 inches in diameter, right back to where the base of the nipple uh, enters the chamber, right? So it's parallel sided all the way back to there. And you had a very, very thin piece of metal remaining where that bolt cut was machined out. And they found that the proof loads were bulging it the first time. If they loaded a second proof load, it was blown it out. It was blown it out almost every time. And some guns that were that were just sold into service, uh, you know, on the civilian market, uh, to other customers, were also blowing up. They weren't getting proof loads, but if they were getting overloads, uh, or if they were marginally a little bit thinner, they were blowing out right there. So the army said, uh, "Look, you got to fix this before we buy any more of these." Just not good. So Colt put their thinking cap on. And they came up with what's known as the cavalry chamber. And what that is, is instead of being straight board all the way back to the nipple, it was straight board back to within about a eh, quarter inch of the nipple. And at that point, they concaved it, right? So think of it as like a dome shaped cut at that point. So that put that curve of the dome, put more steel under the bolt slot. Uh, in fact, it was twice as thick there. And that was enough to be able to withstand the proof charges and go on about its business for the rest of its service life. So at that point, we had the 1860 Army Revolver that we all know and love. And that's how it came about. The Colt 1860 remained in production from 1860 until 1873. 
when it was replaced by the uh, cartridge firing Colt single action army revolver, the Model P. And in that time, it had some variations, especially early in the game when, when Colt was fine tuning things. So I'm going to go through the model variations of the Colt 1860 Army uh, so you'll know what the changes were. So we've got the first model of the 1860 Army, and that's also known as the short stock model because that's the one that had navy grips on it. And, and that's a real distinguishing feature. So the first models had what's known as a Type 1 frame, uh, and each of these models has a unique frame. So the Type 1 frame was a three-screw model. The recoil shields were not cut for shoulder stock. It had a large capping cutout uh, that was placed a little bit below center on the right recoil shield. And it had no capping channel machined into that capping cutout. Of course, they had the 1851 Navy grip assembly, uh, typically in brass. Some on the civilian market might have been silver plated. 1851 Navies were generally brass uh, grip frame and trigger guard, but they were silver plated. Right? That was that when we get them today, they mostly have no plating left on them because it's been worn off. But originally, all the Navies were silver plated, but the armies using the same grip were not. And it had an early round cylinder, no flutes, with the straight board chambers. It had a seven and a half inch barrel. In fact, early on, seven and a half inch and eight inch were both standard factory barrel options for the Army. Now, these were all made in 1860. About a hundred were made, and most of them were sold in 1861. That takes us to the second model of the Army. The second model has what's known as a Type 2 frame. That's a four screw. So it's got the two screws to support hooking the shoulder stock, you know, the, the detachable butt stock that it came with. The recoil shields were cut for the detachable shoulder stock. The capping cutout on the recoil shield is smaller than the Type 1. It's more centered, and it has a, a shallow V-shaped capping channel machined into it. All of the Model 2 guns had Army grips, Army size grip frames, iron back strap, brass trigger guard. They came with either round cylinders or fully fluted cylinders, so there's a mix in there. Now, any cylinders that were made before the first week in July of 1861 had straight board chambers. Those that were made after the first week in July of 1861 had the cavalry chambers. So if you should buy one of these on the antique market and you want to shoot it, better find out when it was made or have a good visual inspection done of the chamber type uh, because if it's got cavalry chambers, you're probably okay. Uh, my gun does, and I shoot it. If I had a gun with straight chambers, I would only shoot it with very light loads. Now, the uh, the Model 2s, the second model, had either 7.5 inch or 8 inch barrels. It could have them either way. And we know that at least one of each of these barrel models were made. Uh, 4.5, 5.5, 6 and six and a half inch barrels. Each of those barrel lengths had at least one example made. So for those of you that are looking for some historical documentation to feel better about your uh, Pieta five and a half inch barrel sheriff's model, here it is. <laughs> Point to this. Just tell them you've got a second model uh, 1860 Army Colt. You got, you got the one that had a five and a half inch barrel. So they were made from November 1860 to March of 1862, and about 35,000 of these were made. So this was one of the heavier production runs. Uh, in fact, the second model and the fourth model 
were the largest production runs of the various models of the Colt 1860 Army. So the next one is the third model that has a Type 3 frame. It's a four screw. It's got the cuts in the recoil shield for the detachable buttstock. It has the, the early uh, large, um, somewhat lower than center, capping cutout on the right recoil shield. And it has no capping channel. got the army size grips. Once again, you know, iron back strap, brass trigger guard. Uh, they, all the third models had just round cylinders. There were no more fully fluted cylinders uh, that came out after the second model. So just the round. They all had cavalry chambers. So that's all to the good. All of the third models had eight inch barrels. At, at this point, and this is because the army contracts were kicking in. The Army wanted 8 inch barrels, and Colt just stopped making the 7.5 inch barrels. They just made 8s. And if you were buying a civilian gun, you got an 8. So, uh, which I think is kind of unfortunate. I actually like the 7.5 inch barrels on, on the Army, but you know, they, you just don't see them. Now, third models were made from April of 1861 to March of 1862. But only about 1,300 of them were made in total. So, fairly small run. That brings us up to the fourth model. The fourth model was the largest production run of any model that Colt had. Uh, and if you're finding an actual first-generation antique Colt 1860, the odds are very good that it's going to be a fourth model. Uh, so here, here's what they look like. Have the Type 4 frame. So that was a three-screw frame, but it did have the uh, recoil shield cutouts for the detachable buttstock, even though it didn't have the supporting screws for them. I'm not sure why they did that, but, uh, but they did. And it had the smaller cutout for capping uh, with a um, capping channel machined into it. Uh, most of these will have had the deeper U-shaped capping channel instead of the shallow V-shaped capping channel, but there are a few early ones that have the V-shaped channel. Once again, 8-inch barrels, Army uh, grip frame and trigger guard, all standard. These guns were made from 1862 to 1865. And 117,000 of the fourth model were made, by, by far the largest production run of, of any model. And that takes us to the last variation, which is the fifth model. This has a Type 5 frame. It's got a three-screw frame, once again. But in this case, the recoil shields are not cut for the shoulder stock. Which, which is just sensible. Why, why add that step? Uh, the capping cutout is the smaller center type. It has the U-shaped groove, right? So it's, uh, it's the later style. It's got army size grips. All, all the chambers, of, of course, are all cavalry, uh, cavalry uh, chambers. Had the army size grips. Had a round cylinder. Barrels are 8 inches long. It was manufactured from 1862 until 1872. And about 33,000 of these were manufactured. So this is another fairly high, high number. Uh, but, but still less than a third of the fourth model. So there you go. Those are the different models of, of the Colts. Now, as I've done in other videos, I thought it would be interesting to run through some examples of these among the uh, the current replicas and, and take a look at, at my own originals and just see what we've got. So my original Colt 1860, which was made in 1864, is a fourth model, which is, is no surprise at all. So it's got the three screw frame, it's got uh, cuts for the shoulder stock, 
It's got the capping cut out, small size, and it's got the capping channel, uh, which is a U-shaped capping channel. So, fourth model, right on the money. Now, my second generation Colt, which is an F-series, is a second model. It's got the four screw frame. It's got the cuts in the recoil shield for the buttstock. It's got the smaller capping cut out with a capping channel milled in it, and it has a round cylinder. So, second model. My Colt Signature Series, which is the third generation Colt, is also a second model. So, like the second generation Colt, it's got a four screw frame with the cuts, uh, smaller capping cut out, capping channel. The only difference is my signature series has the fully fluted cylinder, uh, which is also typical for second model. They were both available. So now we'll take a look at the Italian guns. Uh, I have an Uberti 1860. It was made in 1995. So it goes back a ways. And I, I may do a newer Uberti for you at some point in the near future. Uh, it's a second model as well. Four screw frame, cuts in the recoil shield for the buttstock, smaller capping cutout, milled capping channel, U-shaped, round cylinder, nice second model. So now we're going to look at two Piettas. The first one is a standard 8-inch barreled New Model Army that was made in 2011. So, in the sea of second models that we're floundering in, this gun's a little bit different because it's actually a third model. And uh, you can see that it has the older style capping cut out in the recoil shield, the, the larger, un <coughs> excuse me, uh, the larger unchanneled uh, capping cut out. But it is cut to accept the shoulder stocks and it is a four screw model so that that puts it firmly in uh, in the third model of the 1860 army but somewhere between 2011 when that gun was made and 2018 when my five and a half inch barreled Pieta 1860 army was made they made some changes in the frame because my five and a half inch barrel Pieta 1860 which, as I said, was made in 2018, is a second model. They added a capping channel to the recoil shield, which made it a second model versus a third model. So, I'm kind of surprised that they, they bothered to make that change, but it uh, just shows you that these guns are always evolving. And that's why I want to take a look at a later Uberti, which I'll, I'll probably do in a future video, and let you know how that one stacks up. Because between 1995 and now, Uberti may have made quite a few changes. So I'm going to have to check that out. So that's the way the Italian guns stack up and the, you know, the Colt, uh, the Colt reissues stack up. And I think it's kind of an interesting story uh, of, of really what was considered to be the pinnacle of cap and ball six gun design in the 19th century. And I'm not the only one who thinks that. Well, I hope you enjoyed our discussion of the evolution of Colt's 1860 Army Revolver. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. It helps with the algorithm, as we all know. And, uh, and if you like to make a comment, tell me you liked it, because that helps with the algorithm, too, and I love to read the comments. I really do. And if you didn't like it, feel free to make a comment about that. Uh, now, who knows? I might even agree with you and make some changes in the future, which I can't make improvements if you don't tell me where I need to improve. If you just thumb it down and don't tell me anything, well, you're not going to get anything better. Uh, so... Whether you like it or not, I read all the comments, even though sometimes I feel a little masochistic doing it, uh, though generally they're very good, and, and I do appreciate it too. And I, I love hearing from you. 
So we'll be back with some more black powder content uh, in the weeks to come. And until then, bye.